Good morning. Good morning. Hey, it's awesome being with you guys this morning. Uh, hopefully you all had an amazing Easter. Uh, Sunday still comes and happens, so here we are again. So well done for, for showing up. Uh, some people say that East, the, the week after Easter is the least attended service of the year, and I think we're proving them wrong. Come on. I like it. Good job. Uh, Hey, would you just open up to Acts chapter 13? Um, Acts chapter 13, we're going to jump right back into our series. But before I I, uh, get into it, I want to ask you one question because Easter and and talking about resurrection and talking about the why behind what Christ did on the cross and through through the grave, you know, we celebrate that big time on Easter, of course. Uh, Last week, I proposed that we would probably celebrate that and make that part of our everyday life, that it would be in the forefront of our of our walk with the Lord and our the way we live things out. Afterward, uh, I want to ask the question for each and every individual, and even for our church: is okay. So, so now what? So, what do we what do we do now? Do we make changes? Do we make adjustments to our life? Do we? Um, do we ask the question, what's, what's my next step in my faith with the Lord? And so maybe last week you were one of those who said yes to Jesus, you surrendered your life to him for the very first time. Well, hey, like Pastor Bob said, like baptism is, is the very next step. Like getting water baptized, d- declaring publicly, hey, this is my faith with my family. And oh my goodness, by the way, April 21st, you don't want to miss that service. Those, those baptisms, it is such a fun, incredibly uh, celebratory service where people say yes to Jesus and they go under that water and they, they in, in the name of Jesus, the old is gone and as they come up, the new is here. Come on, amen? So maybe your next step is signing up for being baptized. And maybe you've been a Christian for your whole life or, or maybe the last several years and you've never been baptized and it's always been like, oh, I don't know how I can ever do that. Just go to the class and, and ask some questions. There's no pressure. You sign up for it and if it doesn't work, fine. But I want to encourage you, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be phenomenal. It will be a, m- a moment. It'll be a core memory forever that the Lord would solidify on your heart. I am sold out for Christ. And together with the house of God, with the family of God, man, we get to worship that in such an amazing way. So I want to encourage you, ask the question for yourself, what is my next step? What's my next step? Is it to get baptized? Great. Is it to actually become part of the community of a church? Meaning I actually participate in the things that are going on at the church. I, I don't just show up once a month. I actually make it a consistent part of who I am and what I do is by coming and being with the church. I go to men's groups or women's groups, whatever that might be. Maybe it's just I need to re-solidify my devotion to the Lord just on my own primary walk with the Lord on a regular basis. That I wouldn't give in to this idea that I just need to go to church and that's good and I check the box. But no, I'd have an actual relationship and I'd walk with Jesus on the daily. That's the goal, friends. So this should be a time of filling up, filling, being a refreshing, but this is the first step of your week for the rest of the week where you actually dine and commune with, with the Holy Spirit and with the Lord. And we would, we would do that on a regular basis. So what are your next steps? It'd be a great question to ask. So we're in this series of Acts, and so uh, the book of Acts is the now what after the resurrection, right? Anyway, so, so we've been going through the book of Acts forever, and so here we are where, guess what? There, I have an end to this. I realized it this week. It's going to be like in 14 years, but I mapped it out and it's going to happen. So hopefully you're all here still with us, but you know what? I don't even care. Like I love, love, I I care that you're here, by the way. That sounded like I didn't care that you're here. I love going through this. I love seeing what, what do the apostles do? What does this early church do? What am, what am I going to do now that the, now that Jesus has ascended on high? Like, man, it's on us. Like, hey, you're it. Like, friends, I can't be any more serious with you right now. You're it. It's you. And it's not some motivational speech like, oh, I'm going to get my act together. No. It's, I'm going to take my walk with Jesus so seriously. I'm going to follow after him with my whole heart and whatever comes may. And I'm going to walk with him, and as I do that, the Lord is going to send me to to places I've never been before. I'm going to have connections with him. There's going to be such a different walk about my life. And we get to see that throughout all of Acts, over and over and over again. So 
The last instruction Jesus gave his disciples before he ascended uh, in front of their eyes, by the way, he said this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So he's like, you're going to start here, you're going to wait here, you're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, then you're going to go from Jerusalem, you're going to go to Judea, and then you're going to go to Samaria. It's like, hey, we're going to start here in Chico, then we're going to go to California, and then we're going to go to the United States, and then we're going to go beyond that, like this is to all parts of the world, like this is how it starts. And and guess what? It starts with you now, right here. This, it starts here. And then it starts here in my relationships, and then maybe here at this church, and then maybe here in Chico, and then Butte County, and you see what I mean? It's got to start here first. So then you have the day of Pentecost. You know, they wait for the promise of the Father. The Spirit falls on them. The believers are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Phenomenal things are happening. It's incredible work of the Lord. And they're all empowered, check it out, to be witnesses. To be witnesses. That I have seen something that I'm going to witness, that I'm going to testify about, that, that the things of God that he's done in my life, the transformation that he's done here, the fact that he died on the cross and rose again, like, man, this is what I get to be a witness of, this good and incredible news. It's not just a good headline, friends. It's incredibly eternal good news. So you get to see this all throughout the book of Acts, which is so, so incredibly fun. So Acts 13, it's a, it's a turning point of, of the book of Acts. It's an amazing point where they take this gospel that's just in Jerusalem at this point. They receive the power and the promise of the Holy Spirit. And this is where they go beyond Jerusalem. So this is the first organized missionary journey that we're going to get to read here in Acts chapter 13. This is big stuff. This is huge. So when we read this, it's not just, oh, this is another cool story of Paul. Great. Barnabas. Yeah. No, this is like God has set this up in motion. They're paying attention to the power of the Holy Spirit. They're being prompted and led by him. And they go and do the very things that he's asking them to do. And I love it. It's just such an incredible thing. But here they are. They're going beyond Jerusalem. The very place that Jesus died to get to. If you see in the Gospels over and over, he's going to get to Jerusalem. He's going to get there so that he could sacrifice himself for us. And now he's saying, now I want you to go all over the place, wherever you're at, and be a witness in my name. Amen? You're not very loud. Amen? Amen? Come on, come on. All right, if you're new with us, I do that every once in a while or, or a lot. And so just, you, you never know. So if I say it, just come on, come with me, please. I love it. All right, so here we are, chapter 12, just a quick understanding of what chapter 12 was because it leads into chapter 13. And so Peter in chapter 12, he's thrown into prison. James, by the way, he's just martyred. And now they're after the apostles, they're, pers they're being persecuted like crazy, and then they arrest Peter, put him in prison, and he's in the depths of the jail cells, and what happens in the middle of the night, an angel comes, he, he meets Peter, he unlocks things, he opens the doors, and literally walks Peter out. And this is an incredible, miraculous story in the midst of incredibly great, severe persecution. The Lord begins to do things that is just beyond, it's called shocking, supernatural. Not natural. What you and I do on the regular is natural. It's supernatural. This is the things of God. This is miraculous power and authority by God who created the heavens and the earth. And we can believe in miracles because of that. And so that here they are. Acts chapter 12, 24, before we get into chapter 13, it says this, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. So here we are. James is killed. Man. Peter's thrown in prison, persecution like crazy, and yet the word of God that Isaiah says never returns void is flourishing. That's countercultural to what we would naturally think and do. But we have a supernatural God who's miraculous. And so we follow after this God. 
So the gospel, the good news is good news. It's unstoppable. It's not going to stop whether I am at the, the pastor of Life Church or not. Like, it's going to continue on. It's going to be amazing to see how the Lord continues to move this unstoppable gospel because the word of God never returns void. Check it out. Nothing, no government, no law, no evil leader, no amount of persecution, no political system or structure. You know the politics, you know the, the elections happening here in a couple, couple of months. Anybody knew that? So, so when you get all amped up about your person, chill. It's not about a political leader. Let me just share that with you as your pastor. It's about the powerful presence of Jesus in your life. And if you allow him to transform you and those in your family and your household and your church, you begin to see things naturally change because of the supernatural. It's not going to be because of Biden or Trump. Oh, Good Lord, don't put your hope in either of those people. <laughs> so can we just settle that? So I don't have to do a whole four-week series on po politics? But friends, this is so serious. No government structure. No politics. No person. No friend. No enemy will stop the powerful gospel from continuing to flourish and thrive. And if we come under that authority, come under his presence, oh man, that's the life I want. This world's going to be up and down all the time. But I want steady, faithful consistency with my God and my Savior. Amen? Amen. Oh, man, I hit, a, I hit a little bit of a nerve, didn't I? Ooh, talked about politics. I said Trump. <laughs> <clears throat> Psalms 127.1 says this, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Whatever we're doing, it does not matter if the Lord is not in it. So let us labor under the mighty counsel and authority of our heavenly Father who sent his Son for you and I, his incredible sacrifice, let us labor under him because all else is futile, friends. I haven't even started preaching this sermon yet. No wonder I went long last time. Are we ready to read Acts chapter 13? Have I warmed us up a little bit? <clears throat> I'm going to read 1 through 12. It says this, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, teacher uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, check it out, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, so the Holy Spirit spoke, shocking, when they were worshiping and fasting, amazing. And he says this, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Verse 4 says this, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole uh, island until they came to Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, Elymas the sorcerer, for that was what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, walk, uh, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. 
and immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeing someone to lead him by the hand. And verse 12, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, and he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. My goodness, there's like 80 sermons in here. I want to preach them all. So here we go, real quick. There's five guys that, that are mentioned here. You've got Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manaean, and Saul. All men from very different, diverse backgrounds. Not any of them are from the same location or area. These are five guys that the Lord says, oh, this is going to be perfect. So he brings them to Antioch. If you heard me preach about Antioch, Antioch is an incredibly strategic location the Lord used to send missionaries throughout the world. But here they are, they're in Antioch. The church is starting here. And this is where the Lord puts these five people together, these five men that wouldn't normally connect on any other uh, level from, from where they live to economic status, Jew and Gentile, all different types of backgrounds. But yet... Here they were, these five men who had one thing in common, and that is faith in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is what the Lord uses to begin his church right here in Antioch and send out missionaries from this very moment from here on out. It's phenomenal. This is a big deal. So this Acts chapter 13 isn't one you just kind of read over. It's like, man, the Lord is doing so much through this this time and season. So this is God's church, these five men who all have this faith in Christ. And I got to say, like, if you look around the room, there's probably a lot of people here you'd never maybe ever come across ever. Maybe that's because of your age, your place in life, your work, whatever. And it just so happens that we're in the same room. And it just so happens to be that we're called the church, the sent out ones, with a mission from our Savior to go be witnesses to Chico, to Butte County, and beyond. And here we are, this ragtag group of people that the Lord has put together for a mighty purpose. Amen? So you have significance and you have purpose with what you're doing with your life. It matters. It matters what you do. And it matters who you connect with. So here they're worshiping and they're fasting. I love this. They're having church service. They're, they're teaching. They're praying. They're fasting. They, they've set aside their, their, their needs for their body to say, Lord, I want to hear your voice. They're, they're, they stopped eating for a period of time just to go, Lord, I want to hear from you in this moment. And guess what happens? It just so happens it says that the Holy Spirit spoke Man, shocking that when we actually stop and worship and pray and and teach and open the Bible and invite the Holy Spirit to speak, he does. It's incredible. Sometimes people go, I just have a hard time hearing the Lord. Okay. How fast are you going? Have you stopped? Have you stood still for a second? Have you woke up a half hour earlier just to... Lord, speak to me. I want to hear your voice. Do you turn off your phone and your TV at night and just bask in his presence? Well, if the answer is no and you're not hearing God's voice, it doesn't mean that's the only reason, by the way, but just taking time to be still before the Lord will give opportunity for him to speak into your soul. And there's nothing greater than just hearing the voice of God, whether I'm reading and praying and asking. That I'd, and maybe if you're in that season, take, a time, take time to fast. Take, take a meal, take a day, and go, Lord, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abstain from food. I'm going to drink water, and I just want to hear your voice. Lord, I need breakthrough in this area. I need, there's all different types of fasts. We're not talking about that today, but this is what they did. And guess what? The Holy Spirit spoke. Worshiping and fasting always provides an opportunity to hear from the Holy Spirit. Come on. All right. So the Holy Spirit spoke, and it was possibly through one of these prophets and or maybe the, one of these five guys, probably not Saul and Barnabas, because they're the ones being sent out. And here we go. Okay. And I want to remind you this. It says this, that 
that the Lord has called them to, has set them apart for the specific calling, okay? And if we remember the road to Damascus, and then when Saul is struck down and he's blinded, and, and then he, Ananias, he tell, the Lord tells Ananias, hey, you need to go after Saul. Why? Because he is my chosen instrument to share my name, to preach my name to who? The Gentiles, kings, their kings, and the people of Israel. So here's this moment that Saul is probably like, oh, oh, dang, this is my time. You know that Saul, he didn't just like have this moment of blindness and, 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 and then as soon as he was healed, he just went after it. Do you know that he took several years to humble himself, to lay low, to learn, to grow, to connect with the apostles, to wait and to be still before the Lord? And then this is the moment in Acts 13, the hinge point where Paul is going off to the races with his first missionary journey because the Lord has finally anointed it. You know, he could have gone and done it. He had the skill set, he had the smarts, he had the ability, he had the connections, he probably had the money, but he humbled himself and he waited and he was patient till the Lord said, okay, now's the time. So friends, it's okay to be patient. In fact, a lot of times, it's probably more often than not that he wants you to be patient. So let's wait upon the Lord. Okay, let's, let's be still before him, listening for his voice. In Jesus' name. So after the Lord spoke, they laid hands on them and they sent them out. So they sent them on their way. And like I said, this was the first uh, organized account of a missionary journey from Antioch, and then also it was, it was Saul's very first missionary journey of several, and so this is a huge key historical moment in church history, and so we don't want to just skip over that, but, but here's what I'd like to say is that it says this, that the Holy Spirit led them. Okay, so it wasn't just like, I've got this good idea. Hey, Barnabas, we should go to Cyprus, you know, where you grew up, and, and then we'll start our missionary journey there. No, no, no. It was, a, it was a time of fasting and prayer and worship, and then the Holy Spirit spoke through that, and then they prayed and confirmed it over them, and then they made a plan, and then they sent them out. And it's a beautiful thing when this happens. So, so when they go and when they experience hardship, when they experience trials, when they experience everything that's going on in life and they go, man, I don't know, Barnabas, bro, I don't know if I can handle this anymore. And, and they go, no, no, but the Holy Spirit called us to this. So there's a confirmation, a steadiness, a, a, a confidence in the Spirit's calling instead of just my own doing. Because if it's my own doing and I run into all those, man, I'm a snowflake and I'm out. But man, if there's a calling and an anointing of the Lord upon your life to go do something and it says, hey, now's the time and it's even confirmed through your loved brothers and sisters in Christ and you go, that's a whole different ballgame. I want to encourage you to have those people in your life. So Barnabas, like I said, this is where he grew up, is Cyprus. So the Lord says, hey, I'm sending you to Cyprus. And Barnabas, I can only imagine, he's probably like, seriously, you're sending me home. I, I get to go with, with Saul on a missionary journey, and, and you're telling me to go home? Oh, man. I love this, though. I love how the Lord does this. You have Barnabas, who's, who's got the home roots. He's got the home field advantage. He's got all the connections. He's got all the family. He's got all the, the connections. And then you have Saul, born, bred, Pharisee, grew up in the, in, the, in the schooling and understanding and education of Jewish culture and religiosity, and he has the ability to have a conversation with Jews that nobody else can. And so the two together, man, this is an incredible power-packed punch, like in Cyprus. This is an amazing thing that the Lord does. And I, I, I just got to think about this. I came across this quote. It says this about Barnabas going to his homeland. It says, if a person's Christianity isn't believable at home, there's no sense in taking it on the road. Oh, man. If a person's Christianity isn't believable at home, so the question is, is your Christianity believable in your own in your own home. How about, let's take it a step further. In my own walk, 
Am I living righteously, dedicated to the call of Christ? Or am I living this two-faced, hypocritical life, trying to live one way, talk another? And which one is it? You can't be both. It's one or the other. So they come into contact, a sorcerer, a governor, and two Christians. And this is not a plot for a joke. This is actually what happened. So here we are. You have this guy, this, this Jewish false prophet in Bar-Jesus, that Bar-Jesus means son of Jesus. And, and here they are. They're like, <coughs> excuse me, they're like all of the different things. Let me just tell you a little bit about this guy, Bar-Jesus or Elymas. Uh, either one. Bar-Jesus was his Jewish name. Elymas was his, his Gentile name. Bar-Jesus is son of Jesus is what that means. Uh, Elymas means skilled, uh, wise, or learned. He was apparently the moral and religious advisor or court chaplain to the proconsul, okay? And the proconsul is simply the governor of Cyprus. This is essentially the king of Cyprus, there, there's no other Roman authority in this time and or this island that has, is more prominent or powerful than this one man. So all of a sudden, you've got uh, Saul and Barnabas in, in the same room with this sorcerer who's got the ear of the governor, and now they're in this land of these big wigs, and here we are. It's just an incredible scene. And so this guy, Bar-Jesus, he wants nothing to do with Saul and Barnabas and their message because he knows he's a Jewish false prophet. He knows the things of Jewish culture. He knows the things of the Lord. He takes the truth of the Lord and he twists it and manipulates it to benefit himself. And so here they are. It is just the showdown, this advisor chaplain to the governor. It says this, his evil influence was cast against every moral, religious, social, economic, and political good of humanity and its community. I mean, this dude is all for himself. But he's got the ear of essentially the king of Cyprus, the governor. And Saul, I think he... He realizes this right away. The spirit of discernment, it's like, whoa, that, that dude ain't right. And it's interesting what we get to see here. Absolutely. 100. <laughs> so he's no small man. And, and if you look at Cyprus as this island that's, that's really thin but long. It's like 160-something miles long. And Saul and Barnabas started here and they went 100, it says there's 150 Jewish communities within Cyprus at this time, okay? So they're hitting every, not, not probably not every, but many of the Jewish synagogues. And Saul is preaching because he's able to communicate the evangelistic message to, to his people, first to Jews, then to Gentiles. Remember what Paul says in Romans. So, so here we are, and they're going through the island, all the way through, one after another. Don't despise the days of small beginnings, they're faithful with small. They've got to the island. They're starting their trek, and they get all the way here. And then all of a sudden, uh, the governor, the, he hears of these two, and all of a sudden, he says, hey, I want to I wanna hear these guys. So, so bring them into my court. I want to hear what's going on. And so he brings them in, and by the time they've preached all the way through Cyprus, they're here at the very far end in Paphos where, where the governor sits. It's just amazing what the Lord does with our journeys. So I would say the Lord was preparing them the whole way for this moment. And so here they are. And Elymas is completely opposed to what they're trying to do. And this is what happens. So verses 9 through 11, Saul confronts Elymas, the sorcerer. But it says this, very first thing that I feel like may, might be the takeaway for us here. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Before he did anything else, before he, he confronted him, before anything else, Luke makes it a point to say this, and he does it over and over and over again in Acts. They were filled with the Holy Spirit for boldness and courage and the strength to stand up and confront a spirit that was not from the Lord. So he confronts him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul has seen and dealt with this before. If you look back in Acts, there's another story. Uh, Pastor Bob preached on it. It's an amazing account where, where Saul just confronts the spirit. And he stands up and he, 
And he looks at him and he says, no, look at me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not backing down from you. I am not under your authority is really essentially what Saul is doing. Everybody else was under the cowering cloud of this, of this man. And Saul's like, uh-uh, not gonna, not gonna happen. And then he goes, he insults him in front of everybody. He goes, I'm looking at you, bro. And he goes, you are the son of the devil. And in the crowd, it would have reverberated through everybody. Why? Because his name's Bar Jesus, son of Jesus. And so when, when Saul takes it and he flips it on its head, he says, no, no, you are the son of the devil. It's exactly like when Jesus said this to the Pharisees, you belong to your father, the devil. And this is huge confrontation. And Saul is not backing down. Why? One, because he has the power of the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And also he's not under his authority. He's under the authority of the gospel. He's under the authority of Christ. And so here he is, he's going, this is, this is like crazy what you all are doing because of this one man. And they want, they're also at the same time preaching this message. And then he goes, in this way, you're going to go blind for a few days or for a time. You're going to go blind. My goodness. Remember Paul? On the road to Damascus, he gets knocked over and blinded for three days. And I just think, did Paul have grace for this guy? He didn't, he didn't cower to his fear and, and doom and gloom and, and his demonic presence and spirit. This dark magic, that it, this sorcerer that he was, he didn't cower to that. But he said, for a time, you're going to be blind. And immediately, darkness and mist fell over him. You won't even see the, the light of sun is what he says. And I just think of this parallel track that, that Saul was on at the road to Damascus when he needed Jesus the most, he had to go blind in order to see God. And in this very moment, this man needed to go blind in order to hopefully see Jesus as well. It says that he was groping around fi- trying to find somebody to, to help him. This is the same thing with Saul. Saul had guys hold his hands and walk him all the way to Damascus. Could you imagine this great Pharisee this great man. He's, I need somebody to hold my hand. It's, it's been said by two famous historians in this time that Elymas actually came to Christ. That his blindness went away and he came to Christ. It's not indicated in scripture, but man, isn't that what you want to believe? Like, I just so want to believe that that's the story, that God would have healed him and that he would have given his life to Jesus and, and been the Saul on Cyprus that, that Saul was here for him. I just think it's phenomenal. I want to have the worship team come up. We're going to close in worship. I think we got time. We're going to do it. It's fine. You guys waited for this service. The others can wait for the next service, I guess. But check it out. In verse 12, it says this. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. So when this mighty Roman governor, a Gentile, the leader of all of Cyprus, when he saw what had happened and he heard what Saul taught, he believed. He gave his life over to Jesus. And this, to me, is just phenomenal. I think as a Roman officer and being where he was, he probably understood and respected authority and power. And so he was probably like, yeah, Saul, nice one, bro. That's cool. But more than that, he, he was convicted by the teaching. He was convicted by the powerful, unstoppable gospel that we've been talking about. And my hope is that you too would also have that same experience with the gospel. That it would always make us go, oh my goodness, Lord, Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can we stand together? So as we close, let's let's hearken back to when, when the Lord spoke to Ananias in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. When he tells Ananias, hey, you need to go find Saul. He's blind. You need to lay hands on him. And he's in. And Ananias is like, dude, no way. That's crazy. This guy's trying to kill people. And what does he say? 
He says, Saul is my chosen instrument that I have called to share my name with who? Gentiles, their kings, and the people of Israel. Do you realize in this moment, in the court of the proconsul, those three communities were right there, right then. The governor, the leader over all of Cyprus, the Gentiles, and Israelites. They were all there. And I just think this moment is incredible. That the Lord would lead us all the way to this moment. And the Lord is doing something in your life too. So I just want to pray that you would understand what the Lord is inviting you to. That you'd be led by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then let's close out in worship. Jesus, we, we just love you. We thank you that you're a God who knows what we need, Lord. You're your God who knows, Lord. If we need to be blinded in order to see you, Lord, may it happen. Lord, that we would hear your voice and we would only do what you're asking us to do, Lord, that we would even let go of things that we've held on to or have been doing if you haven't asked us to do it. And so, Father, we just ask that you would lead us, you would guide us, Lord, you would use us like Saul and Barnabas and these other five and these new missionaries, Lord, that, that we would be called to a mission that's greater than our own individual lives, Lord. It would be a kingdom-minded mission. And so, Jesus, I thank you for your gospel message. Thank you for your resurrection and the death on the cross, Lord, that you came and you paid a price for us. So, Lord, we surrender it to you. We surrender our lives. We lay them down and we say, Lord, have your way. Speak to us so clearly. May we have the boldness of Saul to stand up against any unrighteousness in our own lives and those around us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's worship and give it to the Lord.
bless you, Lord. We praise you. We exalt you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here and that you guide and lead us. Thank you, Lord, for all you have done. We praise you and thank you in your mighty name. We pray. Amen. Thanks for coming today. Be blessed. See you next week.